master's class, Women in Yellowstone, a history of recreational pursuits. Before we get started, oops, there's something in the middle of my screen there. Before we get started, uh, let me tell you a little bit about New Knowledge Adventures. Um, NKA was brought to the Treasure Valley in 2015, and it was modeled after a very successful lifelong learning program in the Pocatello area. We are so grateful for all of our volunteer instructors and those who volunteer to serve on communities, committees and in other capacities that help NKA to run smoothly. Before we get started, there are a few ground rules to cover. First of all, your um, microphones will be muted. So if you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat box, which I will monitor. And then uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll look at the questions posed there and give Brandy a chance to answer those. Okay. Uh, the other uh, bit of housekeeping, um, if you need to leave sometime during the presentation uh, before it ends or when it ends, uh, you'll use the, the leave button. It's usually in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. All right, let me introduce today's presenter. Brandy Burns is the Executive Director of the Yellowstone Historic Center, which operates the Museum of the Yellowstone in West Yellowstone, Montana. She received her BA degree from ISU and her master's from BSU. Brandy spent 12 years as the city historian in Boise, where she focused most of her research on the American West. Currently, she serves as the chair of the Public History Committee of the Organization of American Historians. Brandy's previous speaking engagements include academic conferences, Roots Tech, which is the world's largest genealogy conference, and numerous community presentations. Please welcome Brandy Burns. Thank you for having me this morning. Let me just get my slides up here for you. Okay, can everybody see the slides now? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm thrilled to be here this morning. And as you now know, my name is Brandy and I am the executive director of the Yellowstone Historic Center in West Yellowstone, Montana. I live over here in Island Park in Eastern Idaho. So I have a little bit of a commute every day, but it's really, it's a really nice drive. Um, the YHC is a 501c3 nonprofit and we actually operate the Museum of the Yellowstone, which is open during the summer, the summer months. <clears throat> and um, we just closed in early October. We also operate the Union Pacific Dining Lodge, which was built in 1925. It was um, designed by Gilbert Stanley Underwood. And we run that now as an event center. And we have a lot of lovely weddings there during the summertime. It's just a lovely building. Um, so today my subject is Women in Yellowstone, a history of recreational pursuits. I really wanna talk about women who were out hiking and fishing and sightseeing and um, just being out there in nature. But one of the questions of course that I can't help but ask myself and I'm sure others ask it is why do we care? <laughs> because well, the reason that I'm coming up with is that bes beside this image that we have of 19th century outdoor recreation, <clears throat> which this is just a quick night, um, Google search for images that I did. If you look in there, you see mainly men. Um, there is one lady on a bike down here. But despite that this is the images that we get, we know that women were really out there getting dirty and having fun and conquering mountains. They too felt what John Muir wrote to his sister in 1873, that the mountains are calling and I must go. So let's take a look at some of these women who answered the call to go to the mountains in Yellowstone and to see the geysers and the rivers and the wildlife. My first lady that I like to talk about here is Frances Joins Frances Joyce Farnsworth. <laughs> she was the author of several children's books during the 1920s to the 1950s. I 
have to admit, I do not know exactly how she'd like to play outdoors, but I do know that her trips to Yellowstone National Park inspired her very popular series, Cubby in Wonderland and Cubby Returns to Yellowstone. Um, she's currently a part of one of my projects I'm calling The Search for Francis Joyce, Francis Joyce Farnsworth. She's kind of tricky to find, to tell you the truth. Um, I have found out that she used her daughter's name as her pen name. So Francis Joyce is, is her daughter's name. And her actual name was Ava Mae Greenwood. And she married Harry Frazier Farnsworth in 1916. Um, Ava was born in Kansas in 1891. And she went to Colorado sometime after 1910. Uh, I am trying to figure out why she went to Colorado. I just can't quite figure out if she um, had met Farnsworth in Kansas or maybe her and her parents moved to Colorado. But I do know that she married what do you mean, Farnsworth huh? there in Colorado. I hope you guys can't hear my dog whining. I've shut my door. <laughs> um, they moved to Riverton, Wyoming. Um, Harry had a job managing an insurance agency there, and he eventually opened up his own insurance company there in Wyoming, and Ava began writing children's stories, I think probably after she was married, but I'm not really quite sure yet. Um, I'm guessing that based on her time, um, her publishing dates. <clears throat> Before she ever wrote Cubby in Wonderland, um, which was published by the University of New Mexico Press in 1932. She had published other nature stories throughout the 1920s. Uh, some of these included Mrs. Hummingbird's Double, Mr. Possum Visits the Zoo, and Baby Hippo's Jungle Journey. Um, when Cubby in Wonderland, this one in red, debuted, the Riverton paper, Riverton, Wyoming paper, it was called Riverton Ranger, reported that Ava had received a letter from Horace M. Albright, the director, oops, sorry, the, there we go, the director of the um, National Park Service. And the paper ran this quote right here, quote, Cubby in Wonderland is one of the most interesting children's nature books that I have seen. It is interesting to grown-ups as well as children. We are making a note regarding this book in our service bulletin, which is distributed among all the park people in the hope that some of them may become interested in it as a Christmas gift. Hoping that you may meet with the success you deserve in the sale of Cubby, I am sincerely yours, Horace M. Albright. Um, so <laughs> I think that's pretty cool uh, that Horace Albright wrote her a letter about the book. Um, and it just shows you how popular Cubby in Wonderland really was at the time. Um, Ava did dedicate this book to her mother-in-law, Kate Barclay Farnsworth, writing, quote, in memory of happy days together in Yellowstone Wonderland, end quote. Um, so I think she probably took a couple of trips to Yellowstone, living so close to the park as she did with her family, her mother-in-law, I'm sure her children. Um, and she was out there enjoying nature. Um, another reason why I'm really curious about Ava here is her cubby books became really defining moments for many children that grew to become avid lovers and visitors of Yellowstone National Park. Um, many of the girls and women who would begin to have their own adventures in the world's first national park. So I just know that there is a story of her life that will help us give context to the park in the 1930s, as well as say something about children's literature at the time. So I am still researching her life, um, looking for connections for descendants and all of the copies of her books. It's actually quite easy to get a hold of Cubby in Wonderland and Cubby Returns to Yellowstone, as well as this later one that she published in the 50s. Tyke and Tiny in the Tetons, um, but I am, I haven't seen copies of those original books, so I'm really curious to find out, um, to find all those copies and any descendants. So if you find, 
if you know of this family or anybody that's related to them, I will give you my email address at the end of the presentation and I would love for you to reach out. Um, I know that oftentimes finding history is a community effort, especially when it comes to finding the stories of women. Okay, so let's go to our next lady. This is Carrie Bell Spencer, and she kept a diary during her 1892 trip to Yellowstone National Park. She traveled with her brother and his wife in July and August, and um, all of this is pretty typical of most tourist visits to the park, but what I like about her is that she did keep this diary and then her family put it online. So it was really easy to reference and look at. And by keeping her diary, she lets her see her experience of her adventure 130 years later. And from her writing, we can see the fun that she had playing outdoors. And then you can also see some of the downsides of seeing the park by horseback. And we can probably be pretty grateful to the fact that <laughs> we can, if we are in the park and there's a snowstorm in August, we're in the car and we can stay warm. <laughs> um, so I'll start with this first quote um, because this is one where you can find that she's actually fishing. Quote, had a nice shower this morning about five o'clock, so the a.m. has been cool and pleasant. I rode horseback until noon. We stopped by the side of the riverbank to fish a while and was quite successful. Camped at noon near Mud Geyser, which is the greatest curiosity I have seen. We are on the banks of the Yellowstone in a lovely place for trout fishing. Here it is that I caught my first trout. Had all we could eat for dinner and everyone pronounced them splendid. I just love that little detail that this was a lovely place for trout fishing and that this is where she caught her first trout. Um, the second quote um, is earlier from the trip in July, but um, <laughs> what's fun about her diary is it just shows you how long it took for people to actually get into the park. Um, so even in July, they had been traveling for at least a couple of weeks by now and they still weren't in there. Um, that, but they were roughing it already. Quote, the morning was cloudy and very cool. The mountains were in sight and looked very pretty. Drove all the a.m. past the 30-mile pasture. Camped at 11 o'clock at the new town on the bank of a stream by the same name. It was pretty warm by this time, and soon after camping, we were in the stream having a good bath and swim. 35 miles from Clear Creek to Sheridan. Left here at three o'clock and traveled until seven, where we camped in a beautiful little valley surrounded by hills of various shapes and sizes on the Wagner's prong of Dutch Creek. The coyotes were rather numerous around camp that night. Went about 25 miles today. So, the, you know, 18, this early 1890s, it was quite the trek to get into the park. Um, Another thing that is fun about Carrie is that she's good at capturing the human, the, the humor of her traveling companions, as well as being kind of humorous herself. Um, on Tuesday, August 2nd, she wrote, cool and cloudy until 10 o'clock, left camp at 730, passed a lovely fruit farm and invested in gooseberries and raspberries. We are now camped for dinner and I am sitting on the rocky hillside beneath the shade of a friendly pine. I hear the welcome call of dinner is now ready in the dining car, the rear car. <laughs> so we know, you know, at this point they were traveling by horseback. They did have a buggy. Um, their tents were the big canvas tents, uh, but there was definitely not um, the railroad at this point in time on their trip. We have traveled along the railroad and the Yellowstone River all day. The scenery has been immense. Arrived at Stillwater at 4.10, camped about one mile from town, and Addie and I went to the train, which arrived at 5.30 to meet Allie. So I guess what I do need to say is there is, outside of the park, there is rail service in the north part of the park um, that went into, um, it got you closer to Mammoth. 
but from my readings of her, they often followed the railroad route and they were out camping. Um, her brother, Allie, that's what she calls him, um, he didn't join them immediately in the trip. Um, he is sort of taking care of whatever his business was on the route. Um, she noted the mosquitoes are most too numerous for comfort tonight. John has built a big sagebrush fire and I helped S with the dishes, sprinkled some this PM, met four cow punchers, lovely moonlight evening, went 26 miles today, 155 miles from Billings to Livingston. So John and S are actually um, guides on this trip that they're taking. Um, she wrote a lot about the scenery, which that's pretty typical about these travel accounts into Yellowstone at the time, and really even today. Um, on August 5th, she wrote left camp at 7 a.m. Alva and I made 10 miles horseback, followed along railroad and Yellowstone River very close all day, stopped at a neat little schoolhouse to interview the teacher a while and found that she was from Boone County, etc. The scenery is still lovely, ledges of rocks towering hundreds of feet above our heads while along the road side were wild rose bushes from six to 10 feet high. Arrived at Livingston at one o'clock, camped about half a mile from town. After dinner, went to town in the buggy and did some shopping. So even in the early 1890s, you know, there are concessionaires catering to the tourist. Um, so that that's still the same. <laughs> this seems to be the town of the West, population 3,500. Visited the taxidermist store, which was the finest of the kind that I ever saw. Cool and cloudy in the PM as usual. When leaving the town, we at once entered the Yellowstone Canyon, and for several miles, the scenery was lovely on either side. Camped at an opening in the canyon, on a small hill, just overlooking the river, and a more beautiful moonlight picture I never saw. The moon arose just above the snow-capped mountains. The reflection of the moon in the water and on the rocks of different shades and the shadows of the pines presented a lovely scene and one not soon to be forgotten. So I will note that, you know, she did occasionally ride in the buggy. She makes a lot of notes about how long she made it on horseback. So she did spend quite a bit of the trip riding horses on this very- Am I supposed to sit here and read this? Sure. No, I'm, I'm reading it out loud to you. <laughs> um, as their trip progressed into August, the weather was cooling down. We know that even now it is chilly in Yellowstone in August occasionally. Um, she noted on the 7th that she wore her winter clothing and she had been none too warm. Um, just a few days later, they woke up to frozen water, um, half an inch on the top. And um, this is another nice entry because she talks about hiking. After dinner, we started for the lower falls, which are a quarter mile below the upper. It was a beautiful winding path along the hillside. And when reaching the spot, one could but stand in awe and wonder as the beautiful emerald streams, 200 feet wide and narrowing down the 70 feet, was falling over a precipice of 360 feet. Then the Grand Canyon just below was a site for two grand, far, sorry, this is her original spelling. She meant far too grand for my descriptive powers. After leaning over a grand rock for half an hour, watching the turbulent waters so far below, we again took a beautiful mountain trail, and this proved to be the highest hill that I ever had the pleasure of climbing. This brought us to a huge rock projecting out into the canyon about a quarter miles below the Grand Falls and is known by the name of Point Lookout. Here, one has a most excellent view of the falls and canyon. Um, so we do, we have to turn to these written works to find these women outside doing all of these fun outdoor activities. I will say that after her trip to Yellowstone, Carrie returned home to Camp, um, Nebraska. She was a teacher there. She married um, a few late years later in 1897, and she then homesteaded with her husband um, there in Nebraska. I 
just really like these diary entries and wanted to share them because it, it shows how one woman roughed it in Yellowstone National Park. But it brings me to my next woman, um, Maggie Merriman. She's more of a contemporary. Her nickname was the Fly Fishing Lady of the West. Often people also refer to her as the second most famous fly fishing woman in the world. The first being Joan Wolfe. Um, Maggie was born in, on September 26, 1936 in Pasadena, California. She did start fishing at the age of 10 during family outings, but did not enter um, her career of fly fishing until her mid thirties. Um, she talks about going on fishing trips with her family. Her father would go fishing for steelhead. Um, Maggie here and her sister and mother would fish for trout. Um, after two years of fishing in Southern Oregon, the family switched their annual fishing trip to the Nine Quarter Circle Ranch in the Gallatin Valley of Montana. Um, it is the Gallatin Valley where Merriman's career as a fly fisher really begins. In 1972, um, one of her friends and the owners of the Nine Quarter Circle Ranch invited Merriman to attend the Berkeley Fly Fishing School, which was being hosted at the ranch, and then the next year to teach an annual fly fishing school at the ranch for their visitors. Um, she just really fell in love with the activity and, and being a teacher. Um, at the time, her main career was painting for a furniture company. She supplied most of the artwork to the company's showroom. She had earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the University of Arizona and also studied commercial art at the Art Center of Los Angeles. But by the mid 1970s, she realized she could really go no further in her career. And she decided, um, well, here, I'll let her say it in her own words, quote, I saw a dead end. So I said, okay, what is it you really love to do in life? And I thought, well, I love to paint and I love to fish. So I gave myself a five-year plan, end quote. <laughs> so she, what she would do is during the summers, she would teach at the Nine Quarter Circle Ranch for eight more years up until 1981. And then she worked to promote herself as a fly fishing instructor, creating her own school called the Maggie Merriman Fly Fishing School in 1978. Here's another picture of Maggie. Um, as well as a vest that she designed and had made. In 78, she held the first women only fly fishing seminar in West Yellowstone for a regional group of the Federation of Fly Fishers. Um, she held another one the next year in San Francisco for the Golden Gate Angling Club, which really had only opened membership to women just a few years prior. And in 1982, there was another women only workshop that was held in Boise, Idaho. And this time there was a record attendance. 144 women attended, which required the one day workshop to expand into two days. Um, and it became really a signature event for fly fishing for women. Um, just Maggie's school and then that, that particular event in Boise. Um, excuse me real quick. That same year, she moved her school to West Yellowstone, and that's where she held it thereafter, and she designed a woman's fly fishing vest. You have to think, this is the 70s and 80s. If women wanted to fish, um, they had to make do with their own um, regular clothes or try to wear men's clothes, and, you know, men's waders didn't fit right, and all, there was all kinds of trouble. So Maggie here was really designing for women. Um, this was the first fishing vest to feature colored zippers. Uh, you can't quite see it, but there is a paisley lining in here and a snap closure over the chest instead of a zipper. Um, and in addition to a vest, she actually also made a signature rod for women called the Maggie Merriman rod. And here's a zoomed up picture here of her um, label in her clothes. 
she did sell the vest under a line in her own name and designed some other fly fishing related products other than the vest and the rod. Her line sold very well, but after five years, she stopped production because they were just no longer economical to produce in the US. And she was really concerned about quality control. So she wanted, she didn't want to do it anymore because she just didn't think that she could get the quality that she wanted. Um, she continued her school in West Yellowstone during the summer months. And then during the winter, she went to Huntington Beach, California, which that's a pretty common story here in West Yellowstone. The winters are not for everyone. And it seems like quite a few people do winter in California. Um, Maggie passed away on September 30th, 2016 at the age of 80. And if you look for her, you will, and I've got this little link here. Um, if you Google her, you'll be able to find this video of her fly fishing. I won't play it all, even though it's like two minutes, but I just want you to listen to her voice um, and then I'll stop it. So <laughs> that was her. She was an excellent teacher and she brought a lot of women into the sport. Um, I do, excuse me real quick. I need another drink of water. Um, I'm on a fly fishing kick. So <laughs> the next few women I'm gonna talk about were also women who were notable in the fly fishing recreation world here in West Yellowstone. Um, I'm working on a project that I'm tentatively titling Women in the Wild, Biographies of Western Women Who Played Outdoors. And right now I have a lot of women who are fishers. So I might just need a separate project for them. Um, there really are a lot of fly fishing women in the Yellowstone area. Um, and several of them are mentioned in a great book called Fly Fishing West Yellowstone, A History and Guide by Bob Jacklin and Bruce Staples. Um, Bob is a world-renowned fly fisher and guide, and he's kept either as a hobby or as, as you know, one of his passions, he's kept this history of fly fishing in West Yellowstone, and he chronicles it in this book. Um, one of the first women he mentions is Lillian Hackett Hansen and the Culver Pond. Um, and this, this here is Lillian's house and where the, the pond area is at. Lillian was a seamstress in Dillon, Montana when her and her husband began homesteading in the Centennial Valley in 1900. And the Centennial Valley is over here near, it's in Gallatin County near West Yellowstone. Um, they created a pond on their ranch to water their cattle, and then they stocked it with native cutthroat trout and grayling, mostly to provide um, food for them and their family. Um, Lillian and her husband did eventually divorce, and her son, one of her sons remained and helped run the homestead, and her, Lillian and her son started to charge um, fly fishers a fee to catch the rainbow and brook trout in their pond. Um, it is commonly called the widow's pool today. And Lillian here, she pretty much marks the beginning of paid sport fishing in the area. Um, and because she's really the beginning of that sport fishing, I now wanna talk a little bit about the economy of fly fishing in West Yellowstone. It's huge and it, dates back from the beginning, I mean, way before the beginning of the town of West Yellowstone. Um, but here I'm just focusing on a few um, notable women from the 1930s to the 1980s. Um, they each form a, a part of this long history. Uh, the first lady here, Mary Dinty Martinez, 
She became known as a really excellent fly tire. She supplied flies for her father's West Yellowstone fishing merchandise store. And her father, Don Martinez, um, he's the, he had the fly fishing store. Um, his fishing expertise was widely sought off in the area. Um, he, him and, and Mary, they did live in California during the winters and they would tie flies over the winter and they would operate there's his store in West Yellowstone during the summertime as he grew as his name grew and his business grew he opened a store in Jackson Wyoming also so he had he had two stores going um these flies that you see are not Mary's flies but they are flies from another notable woman in town and these are actually in our collection at the museum they're tied by sig barnes um, she tied flies and operated the pat barnes tackle shop and guide service with her husband pat barnes um, her husband pat he mostly did the guiding in the area but she was really quite famous for her flies and they were really sought after she would tie flies throughout the year she's another one that she they lived in west yellowstone in the summertime and in the wintertime they moved up to helena um, but she she tied flies all year long getting ready for that summer season and she was quite an innovator um, before the typical tools that we have now for fly tying like a vice um what to hold the the hook and the fly what she used is she modified her treadle sewing machine so that she could wind the material onto the hook and we have her her sewing machine in the museum as well and it's just really really neat to think about and to look at and um, verna johnson here she was a school teacher in west yellowstone and they, her and her husband operated a fishing business. Um, her husband, he just loved the fishing world and he just really wanted to have this store. Um, but unfortunately he died shortly after World War, coming home from World War II. And so Verna was left to operate the store and she did so with her children and, and then hiring some other notable people throughout the years. Um, among the items that she sold, she did sell the flies um, from another notable woman, Della Tony Sivy. And here, here are some flies that are from the Don Martinez shop. You know, I can't, I don't know who tied them, but it could have been Don, it could have been this Ray Templeton Servatus, or it could have been Mary um, Martinez. But they're, they're still super cool to look at. Um, Ray here is the last woman that I want to really highlight. Her nickname was the First Lady of West Yellowstone Fly Fishers. Uh, she did become Don Martinez's business partner, um, who, he had those two shops, one in West Yellowstone and Jackson, but Don, he moved to Jackson and, and mainly wanted to operate that store. So Ray was here in West taking care of that store. Um, she did also operate the Whispering Pines Motel and Mary Martinez tied the, continued to tie flies for the shop. Um, by 1945, Ray moved the shop to her hotel, but she soon closed it because she preferred to wholesale flies to other shops instead of operating an entire, um, shop business during the summer. Um, and so she, she tied flies, she wholesaled flies from just a whole bunch of other men and women fly tires. And she did that into the 1970s. Um, she did pass away in the very early 1980s. Um, but we have a great, I didn't have it digitized, but we have a great photo of her holding up a really big <laughs> trout that she had caught um, and it's just, just a great image. Um, because there's just so many women to talk about, and this is such a big subject, um, 
I'm still really actively researching all of these women and, you know, taking suggestions for other women. But I do, I do like to provide more reading examples if you find this a really interesting history. Um, because, you know, all history is built on top of itself. <laughs> One person contributes some and then the next person contributes more or, or a little bit more. And I just wanted to let you know about these three books because they've, they've all really been helpful. Um, because I really came at this as a beginner. I knew nothing about fly fishing before I started this research. Um, I had just I've really mainly focused a lot on women and voting and, and as part of that women suffrage history, finding that of course, a lot of women here in the West wanted the vote in order to make differences. It wasn't so much about just getting the vote to them, I should say. They wanted the vote so that they could make a ch change in their world for the causes that meant the most to them. And so we see several women in Idaho and Montana and Utah that are really campaigning for the vote because they want to save wilderness areas. Um, um, there's a woman in Idaho that, you know, she was just really passionate about the Sawtooth Mountains and wanted them to be a national park. So she was a suffragist, but she was doing the suffrage work in order to make a difference in these other causes that were close to her heart. Um, so basically we just, there's just so much to learn. Um, and that includes even us historians. We, we come to a project, we try to understand um, all I understood from sport, from fly fishing as a sport, is it looked like it was more complicated than just regular bait fishing. Um, but that that concept is now changing as I've read these books and I've been talking to fishing enthusiasts in the area. Um, this first one that I want to mention to you is The Unreasonable Virtue of Fly Fishing by Mark Perlansky. It just came out last year. Um, it is a really accessible read for beginners that are not familiar with fly fishing. Um, it's very informative, but I, I didn't really like the way he treated women fly fishers and their contributions. It's not really a poor treatment at all. It's just that I thought it lacked some nuance, but it does a really good job of talking about the heritage of fly fishing. Um, one of my favorite ones here is the middle one, Real Women, The World of Women Who Fish. Um, it's an excellent read. She is such, Lila is such a great writer, and you learn so much about women and all the different ways that they contributed to fishing, from, you know, fishing here in lakes and streams to landing giant, <laughs> just massive sea fish. Um, so I can't recommend this one more. And then this last one, Fly Fishing West Yellowstone, A History and Guide. It's a very quality book about the history of fly fishing in West Yellowstone. Um, and I was really pleased when I first came across it to find these women that we talked about today. Um, and it really was my first introduction. And it, it, it's a great one because it made me curious to find out more. And if a book makes you curious to find out more, then, then that's a great book in my opinion. Uh, it's gotten to the point that yes, I am asking Santa for a fishing rod. <laughs> and I have become the person that's been watching <laughs> fly fishing videos to learn more. Um, it's just, it, it can be quite engaging. Um, if you like other stories about Yellowstone. We have this wonderful Yellowstone History Journal that the um, Yellowstone Historic Center publishes once a year. This is an image of our 2022 journal. Um, we publish it as a print journal, but we've also recently started sending articles out from previous editions straight to email. Um, you can sign up on Substack. I'll have the link in the next slide. Um, this link here, if you just search for the Museum of the Yellowstone and then YHJ, you'll find our page to buy the, the print version. And 
um, memberships to the museum help us tell all of these stories in presentations like this as well as at um, at the museum itself. And then um, this is the page for the Substack. You can sign up at yellowstonehistoryjournal.substack.com. We publish every Monday without fail, although we do sometimes <laughs> take an occasional break for a holiday. So check that out. And then this is my contact info if you'd like to get a hold of me. And I'd be happy to open it up for questions. I'll leave, actually, I'll put this info in the chat so I can stop sharing my screen. All right, and while Brandy is putting her contact information uh, in the chat box, we've got a couple of comments and a question. First from Gypsy, I think it's so interesting she, and this is one of the first women that uh, Brandy talked about, is out in nature where she isn't needing to keep track of time for railroad schedules or work schedules, but keeping track of exact times and distances, so precise. What would she have done with a smartwatch? <laughs> Great thought. And a second, uh, and, and I thought the same thing, Gypsy had commented on uh, how innovative of Zig to use a treadle sewing machine for fly tying. Uh, I have a brother who's an avid trout fisherman and fly tyer. I guess that's a noun. I am going to share this information with him. And then a question. <clears throat> Did these early sportswomen encounter discrimination or marginalizing? Marginalizing, sorry. Yeah, that's a great question too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, women did experience being marginalized in the sport in the very early, like 1800s, 1900s. You know, there was a lot of, <clears throat> we didn't have the really light carbon wheels that we have today or fly rods so one of the sort of barriers that they had was just how heavy the equipment was and that's something that mark kurlansky points out but i still think that if you're determined there there would be women um participating out there in the sport because you know sometimes you just need a, a stick and a some twine <laughs> and a hook um but there were for a long time until Joan Wolf, you know, she, she loved to fish and she loved to be in the sport, but she realized that, you know, no one would want to have her as a guide or take any of her advice unless she became really notable in the sport. And so she did start com competing, um, some in all men competitions, but then really got some women competitions going. And when she won these world titles, then she was able to um, be a guide like she had wanted to be. And Maggie was the same, even in the seventies, like she, there had been, you know, just exclusive women's only clubs. So sorry not women's only club a women's only fly fishing school so when she did her school it was just an opportunity for so many women to be involved um there is a story from Joan Wolf that she loved to fish even as a kid and she would go with her dad but then he went to a competition for the club or something to fish and her brother it was finally old enough to go. He was eight and Joan was 10 and Joan didn't get to go <laughs> that day. And it, it was really sad for her, but and then as the story goes on, she eventually did get taken by her dad to go to fish. Um, they, women really ended up having to carve a, a spot for themselves in fly fishing. Um, it was through Joan and Maggie who started clothing for women. I mean, I'm, I've got my Orvis sweatshirt on today. Um, Orvis is a big fly fishing name. And um, as they saw the success of Joan and Maggie and other women, then they started making 
products for all of these women who wanted them. Um, and so that tradition continues. I am looking at the chat box. I don't see any additional questions posed. If you have one, please use the chat box now. All right, I, I don't see any more questions. So Brandy, thank you so much for sharing this information. Um, and it was so it was so interesting learning about the the early challenges, the the diary entries, the early challenges all visitors, but especially women, had um, uh, visiting Yellowstone. And I I wish my mother were alive to have seen this presentation because she was also a fly fisher person um, in her in her sixties. Got very interested, so um, she could probably relate to some of the challenges. All right, if there are no more questions, Brandy, thank you again so much uh, for this great information. Um, and the contact information again is, uh, oh, there is a question, wait a minute, the chat box, yay. Um, let's see, oh, Lisa wants to know if Brandy fly fishes. <laughs> yes, I, have not officially fly fished yet, but I am asking for a tin car, a fly rod for <laughs> Christmas <laughs> because it's, um, I'm still intimidated by how complicated some of it seems like, am I going to get the right reel? Will I have the right line? What's the right fly? And I overthink too much. So I like the idea of Tenkara, which is, a, I believe it's a 12th century Japanese fly fishing technique. And it's literally just a fly rod with, that's about eight, nine feet to 10, maybe even 12 feet long. And then you have a line that extends out with a fly. And then when you're, you just cast it. And when you want to reel in, reel in, you just pull it up a little bit and then you go for the 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 line and pull the fish in that way with a net so <laughs> that's my goal it seems simple enough that I won't overthink it I'm hoping I have bait fished a lot I remember fishing as a kid all the time um and I kind of stopped fishing when my dad told me I asked him to put the worm on my hook for me because I didn't like to do that. And he's like, I'll do it this last time, but you're old enough to do it from now on. And I was like, okay, I won't fish anymore. <laughs> and then I didn't until this last summer where I did spend a couple of days out there trying to catch something. I didn't, I didn't catch anything though. <laughs> Well, Brandy, good luck with your fishing. And I imagine there's a Trout Unlimited chapter in Montana that can probably give you some more information. Yeah. Uh, all right, and there are kudos coming in on the chat screen. Very interesting information. Thank you so much for sharing with us, et cetera, et cetera. If there are no more questions, I believe that is the end of our session though. Thank you, Brandy, so much. Thank you everyone for participating in our last NKA class of this fall semester. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks. Bye.